Welcome back to another episode of Conservative Conversations. It's your host, Reed and Frank. Back after a little bit of a break, we've been getting some stuff sorted out. It's summertime, we've been traveling and visiting some family and stuff, so been a little busy. And we're ready to get back into it real quick. But how are you doing, Frank? Oh, I'm doing very well. That's how about good. you? Yep, I'm doing great as well. We are recording on none other than the 4th of July today, so happy Independence Day to all you fine listeners. Hopefully you're celebrating nicely, getting some burgers and ribs going on, and drinking some nice cold beer. Oh yeah, gotta have the cold beer on a nice hot 4th of July. That's right. And with that, we'll jump right into this All SCOTUS episode, because they recently wrapped up their term uh, for now with some pretty big flurry of decisions this past week or two. And the first one we're going to start with is one we talked about last year um, when the, I believe the oral arguments were being heard. And it is the Carson v. Macon case uh, originating out of Maine that dealt with uh, the use of uh, public school funding or state tuition funding for uh, whether or not it could be used at a private religious school. And the Supreme Court has decided in favor of Carson, which was the families that were trying to send their Uh, children to the private religious schools and use the available funding that the state provided to go to these schools and um, the you know the opinion siding in favor of Carson is good for you know uh, religious liberties and the exercise of those liberties and uh, some people would also probably include like school choice uh, issues into this Oh, yeah, I would think so. Right. I mean, surely that's what this relates to, you know. And to sort of recap what the case was, or is, I guess was at this point, um, the state of Maine has a tuition program set up uh, for mostly, like, high school students because Maine is a – fairly rural state and in some school districts there aren't enough you know students that live in the area to you know pay for and fund a high school just for a small handful of students so what they do is they can either if a school district doesn't have a high school they can contract with another nearby school and the students go there or if that's not an option the state provides uh, a tuition for students to be uh, to go to any public school or approved private schools and uh, there were a group of parents who wanted to send their uh, students to uh, private private religious schools uh, wanted to use this funding from the state to do so and the state said they're not going to do it um, because they didn't you know they felt that might have been a violation of like uh, separation of church and state. Yes, that's that. That's what I was looking for. So of course, uh, Carson uh, sued the, I believe, the education director of Maine, and this case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And as we mentioned, uh, the court has sided in favor of Carson. So now, I believe that means. Uh, Students in Maine and families in Maine will be able to use the, and this is kind of a key point, the otherwise generally available funds to the students to be used now at uh, religious uh, schools of their choice. Well, and plus, I think it's important. I mean, how does the state get those funds anyway from the from the citizens? Right, the taxpayers. You would think. Yeah. So it sort of is like the state's trying to control how one spends one's own money. Right, essentially, yeah. <clears throat> so it sort of was ludicrous in a, in a way. Mm-hmm. 
<clears throat> from the get-go. I don't remember exactly what analysis we gave at the time. And of course, listeners, you could always go back and check out that episode if you are interested in this particular case. It was very interesting, mm-hmm. um, and I think it's definitely been decided correctly. And it, d- it gives me a lot of hope for school choice, right. you know, because, of course, I think, I mean, not every public school is corrupt or anything sure. like that, but I know they're not all worth their salt either. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, choice in America is important, you know, right. so I think it's a good thing going forward. Yep, definitely. I mean... Presumably, I mean, I don't know how much this af- would affect the, you know, competition of the school since it's mostly a voucher issue where the vouchers can be used. But in, in other, you know, school choice case, that's usually one of the arguments that the more options a student has of schools, generally the better they do because they can go to a school that best fits their learning needs because. Not everybody learns the same. Some people are better at like book learning. Some people are visual learners. Some people, you know, uh, learn by doing. So it's it's hopefully, you know, it opens up the opportunity for uh, better options across other states too. Given this ruling that they can hopefully refer to. Oh yeah, and I think an important little nuance to it is it takes away some of the force. Too. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea that a state can force you into a subpar right. school uh, just because of taxes and the district you live in and right. how, how things. But also, I think it'll hopefully chip away at some of the force that the uh, teachers unions mm-hmm. <coughs> have and exercise over their, their faculty and everything. Right. <coughs> yep. And I believe it was a 6-3 uh, ruling. Uh, all the conservative justices uh, and then John Roberts, who people usually refer to as like a swing vote on the court. Right. They all agreed. I think they some of them had different uh, you know, concurring opinions on it. Um, but then, of course, the three liberal justices dissented. And... I believe that's about all I have on that particular case. And it sort of ties into um, a couple, or at least one other case. Um, I forget the actual title. It's Kennedy versus uh, some school district in Washington State. This was the case where a football coach um, uh, was basically fired from school after... Uh, it was brought to the school's attention that after his football games, he would go to the 50-yard line and say a little prayer. And, um, you know, at, after a certain point of him doing that, other students uh, from his, you know, his team that he coached and even the other teams that uh, they were playing against uh, would join in. And then once uh, somebody complained to the school board or the school directly, one of the two, uh, they told him he couldn't do that anymore, so he sued the school or the school district on uh, religious freedom and exercise grounds, and that was another uh, win in you know conservative columns because the court ruled that uh, it's okay to pray. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Because uh, one, I think one of the big things. Well, the school tried to argue, again, the separation of church and state and all that, and by him, you know, praying on the sidelines, it could have been perceived as, you know, some kind of school-sanctioned thing that people had to do it. But, um, yep, they decided that it's it wasn't in violation of any kind of separation of church and state. He is freely allowed to exercise his religion. He was not compelling or uh, making anybody else join him. And, you know, it's it's in the First Amendment, the free and the exercise of expression. I don't have the exact words of it. but um, I could get it if you'd like. 
uh, if you think it would help. But um, I think it's pretty important because, you know, if if people are you know are religious and the government's telling them they can't perform, you know, their religious expression throughout their life, because to most religious people, that's the whole life is religious. You know, you're not religious just, you know, you're not religious at home, and when you get to school, oh, you don't believe in it anymore. It's if it's with you the whole time. You believe in every aspect of of your life, and uh, for the government to, you know, prevent people from exercising that right is contradictory to the First Amendment. So here's the exact language. Uh, I won't read the whole First Amendment. I'll just read the part that pertains to religion. But it Mm -hmm. says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Right. And one of the things I'd like to get in here— Sure. um, I, you know, I'm glad we piggybacked this off the other thing, mm-hmm. because one of the things I believe that <clears throat> the conservatives on the Supreme Court understand, uh, but maybe a lot of people don't out there, is that secularism in and of itself can often behave like a religion. Mm-hmm, yeah. So <clears throat> the idea that they can browbeat these I mean, just to speak loosely, liberal concepts into kids' heads mm-hmm. in, in the school, but then prevent, you know, any study or, or exercise right. of a private or, or personal religion mm-hmm. um, is sort of oxymoronic because right. you'd think that in a school setting, a, a true, truly liberal uh, educational experience, you wouldn't shy away from studying the Bible, right? I mean, or any any text, any subject, any right. concept. Um, well, but they try to use country. this separation of church and state as a shield to protect their secularism, right? From private and privately held religious right. beliefs, <clears throat> and it's kind of ridiculous, right? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I forget what I was going to say while you were talking. Uh, It'll come back to me here in a second. Uh, Secularism can be a religion. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, especially among conservative circles, we, a lot of us would probably refer to, you know, leftism as a sort of religious or, you know, like religion, at least to them. The way, the way they act, you know, they have their own sacraments and stuff like that. Like abortion, we'll get to that soon, but that's like a sacrament to them. Well, it's it's an interesting dichotomy you point out, and it will come up again mm-hmm. later because they often see things as rights right. that are, are not expressly right. expressly written in the Constitution, and right. then then other things that are, are expressly written into the Constitution. They say, "Oh, they right. want to treat it like it's not there." Like mm-hmm. that's not what it says, right? <clears throat> and as far as like the free expression, I mean, you know it. I don't know how often you'd find this, but this is just an example. You know, Orthodox Jews, a lot of them you know, wear their yarmulkes and stuff like that. Um, and that's part of their, their expression of their religion. And had, you know, would this school district also try to convince an Orthodox Jewish coach, if there were to be one, that they can't wear their yarmulke at the game? While they're playing the game, right? I mean, it it totally breaks down because yeah. once we pick on one of their favorite groups, I mean, we could go down a whole list, but mm-hmm. at some point you get into the the more protected groups, right. like the Muslims. They right. wouldn't ask them to take off their hijabs right. or their well, head wrappings or whatever. I would I would venture to guess that some of these schools that might have you know a lot of Muslim teachers, they probably have a prayer room. Yeah. Because particularly the more religious Muslims, they pray multiple times a day. That's right. And and a lot of these institutions, I know it it definitely exists at colleges, they have special rooms and designated areas for, you know, people like that to go to. 
Right, and we wouldn't pick on them. Of right. course, it would be all right for them to pray. And right. Well, and even as a, a right winger uh, religious person, I mean, you see somebody practicing their faith, and mm-hmm. I, I think that's a great thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, even if it's not my faith, right? You wouldn't just go saying. Now, maybe I could understand if if they push a bunch of, like, if they only teach. Muslim teachings mm-hmm. in the school and, and never open it up to anything else. Right. They don't do sort of a comparative religion right. study. Right. Um, I think you could run into some issues there, but um, even just if I had a child who, who had a Muslim teacher and, and they maybe studied some of the Quran, if, if it, you could you know, present it alongside the Bible or mm-hmm. alongside other religious teachings right. and sort of do comparative Right. Uh, study, uh, I don't think there's absolutely anything wrong with that at all whatsoever. Right. Um, so. Right. Well, I mean, particularly in in our country, you know, you would probably want to teach both, like, the Bible and the Quran, because the Bible itself and Judeo-Christian values are pretty essential to the, the founding of our country, and it would, you know— It'd be beneficial to teach the Bible in context of like the founding of our country. Well, not you know what you're saying is absolutely true, but it even goes bigger than that. It's um, it goes all the way back to the Enlightenment, coming out of the Middle Ages, out mm-hmm. of the Dark Ages, what they call the Dark Ages. Judeo-Christian principles are really what have brought us to where we are. It's right. how people like Galileo right. uh, could think outside of. You know what's what's out there? Where is God? How do we reach? You know, like the Michelangelo painting. Uh-huh. Uh, I think it's called the Touch or something like that. Or it's sh- it's on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel where God is reaching out to man and man is reaching back and they touch huh. at their fingertips. Um, so it's this sort of broadening our minds, mm-hmm. our horizons. What what can we accomplish? How can we reach towards? God and higher power and higher things. Right. Um, stuff like that. I mean, you could go down a whole list. Newton and Galileo and uh-huh. all kinds of people would have never been able to accomplish what they had done without Judeo-Christian principles. Right. Um, and it, it, it's in all kinds of art, as I mentioned, literature. I mean, Shakespeare wouldn't be Shakespeare without uh, the... Uh, what's that horrible version of the Bible? I can't think of it. The uh, the one that's basically like a poem. Oh, I wouldn't know. The King James. The, oh. There wouldn't be a Shakespeare without the King James Bible. So, right. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah. <clears throat> yep, but to, to bring it back to the court case, it's definitely a big win for not just you know Christians, which this coach was, but any, any religion as we were talking about with like uh, the Muslims. Um, or whatever it, whatever somebody's religion might be, this decision is good for them and it's good for the country. Um, hopefully, uh, you know this has broader implications because uh, some people might remember um, I forget the gentleman's name, but the the baker from Colorado. Oh yeah. Um, getting sued multiple times because first he wouldn't make a cake for a same-sex marriage, and then he wouldn't make a cake for some kind of trans party. Um, so hopefully this might have you know broader-reaching implications that even though this mostly dealt with like like the public school and the public institution rather than a private business, but it still comes back to the concept of freedom of, of expression. Well, and I think once again it comes down to an issue of force too mm-hmm. because it's not like this man was forcing these uh, athletes to participate. Right. It was completely optional. Right. It was up to them. Mm-hmm. Um, but instead, you see force. The only force exercised is school. by the state in a, right. in a sense, you know, through the school board, mm-hmm. trying to tell him he cannot do this. Right. Whereas with the, the gay baker well, he wasn't gay baker, but you know, yeah. the the baker who wouldn't make the gay cake guy, the state was trying to force him mm-hmm. to 
make a cake or provide services to somebody he, right. he wouldn't otherwise want to serve. Right. And that's the true abuse. I mean, that's why this is a win here, because right. the only force being exercised in these cases comes from the state. Right. So it's good to strip away that force and remind the state uh, that they don't have that power to force us to bully us around like that. Right. And I think that kind of leads into one of the other decisions that came out um, was the, excuse me, um, the West Virginia versus the EPA case. Sure. And um, I wasn't able to get a whole lot of detailed notes on it, but from what I can tell, it it dealt with at the time the uh, like the clean clean air act or something like that that Obama had passed when he was still in office um, and it dealt with regulating carbon emissions from power plants and uh, electrical companies and stuff like that right. and uh, so uh, the state of West Virginia along with I think a couple like coal companies and energy companies sued the EPA on essentially the grounds that they, they don't have the power to regulate uh, them in the manner that they were trying to. And uh, the court has decided that uh, in this case, the EPA uh, was overreaching what, what powers they did have that were delegated them from Congress. Um, they they said that uh, the EPA did not have the power to regulate the um, carbon emissions on uh, these power plants. Um, and the bigger implication is has to do with like uh, the power of the bureaucracy. And because a lot of things, you know, the Congress will give sort of vague powers or abilities to these uh, federal agencies and then the agency kind of decides you know what they think uh, they could do within those frame the framework that they're given well you're right and it's usually a back door right where so that the government can control something right that they otherwise can't get passed by legislation right Yep, and in this case, um, like I said, I don't have too many specific notes on it, but there will be links in the show notes to all of these uh, cases. Um, but they decided the EPA did not have the power to uh, regulate the carbon emissions based on... Um, they were using some kind of phrases like generational shift, generation shifting, which had to do with, like, uh, who created the carbon and when? Right, and it, it also had to do with the guides of you know, the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, it was trying to basically make economic outcomes. They were trying to get the coal plants and stuff to convert, essentially all to like solar and more renewable sources, because otherwise, if they kept using the coal... Uh, natural gas for the energy, they'd have to pay the, the carbon tax or carbon fees or whatever. Well, if you're really in the know about these issues, that's the point of the EPA anyway, is right. to strangle industry, right. to sh basically bankrupt and shut down industry. Right. But, um, I mean, I didn't study this case too much. I've seen a couple headlines, heard a little mm -hmm. snippets, but... I understand one of the issues was like they were trying to require like how m often these power plants had to test the air. Right. Um, and there's a question of testing the same air over and over two or three times a month or whatever. And, and then, yeah, I mean, just I'm no scientist or anything, but you go out and take an air sample right. and there's carbon in it. Okay, well... You know, let's say I go out in my backyard and take a sample, and they say, oh, there's too much carbon. You've put too much carbon out in the environment, so they're going to charge me, fine mm -hmm. me, 50 bucks. Right. Well, where's the proof 
Right. That that carbon came from me. Right, because trees produce carbon. Everything produces yeah, we, carbon. Yeah, we produce carbon when we breathe out. Yeah. So, I mean, just sort of the idea is preposterous. I mean, sh- sure, it makes sense that a, a big power plant's going to put out more carbon than a person or a car or right. whatever. But just by random sampling, you know, on a given day at a given time or whatever— and to say, oh, well, this exceeds your limit of, you know, however many parts per million of carbon, and so we're going to fine you X number of dollars, right. is sort of farcical because, you know, conditions change in the environment every day. Right. And, um, you know, one of my favorite things to point out is that often when, a, when you have a volcanic eruption, mm-hmm. that puts out more carbon into the environment than practically anything else man could do right um probably short of a nuclear bomb but so i mean just imagine that there's been a big forest fire or an earthquake or Mm -hmm. a a volcanic eruption near the power plant and they go out and test the next day and say oh there's way too much you know (laughs) you got to shut down production you're putting out and it's like, no, they probably put out about the same amount. You All know? the time. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know how you'd exactly study that or, or get the exact figure, but the idea of random testing mm-hmm. is sort of preposterous. Right. <clears throat> yep, and um, like I said, with this case, the, the broader implications uh, go more towards the power of, you know, these agencies and the bureaucracies within them and what they can do because like as we sort of mentioned you know a lot of times the congress will delegate some kind of powers to these agencies and then they find ways you know beyond what has been delegated to them to implement more policies and regulations and rules for stuff they haven't been given the explicit power to do. So hopefully, you know, this will eventually limit the, you know, the overreaching uh, power that some of these agencies have and creating you know, regulations that you know, aren't passed by Congress, that people aren't uh, getting to vote on by means of you know, they're elected representatives. Yeah. And with that, what's our next one? Um, well, I think the next one I have in my notes would be, and it sort of goes hand in hand again. I mean, these th- if you come from a conservative mindset, mm-hmm. these have all been wins yeah. so far. Every th- case that we've detailed so far has been a big win. Uh, or to put it differently, a reaffirmation mm-hmm. of the rights that we know we have that are out expressly expressly outlined in the co- the Constitution. Right. So the next one that I think fits right into that mold is the the concealed carry decision that comes out of New York. Right. Um, because of course we do expressly have the right to bear arms. Um, I'll read the text. I have it right here. I'll just read it. Just to do it, Um, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Pretty simple. Yeah. Pretty simple language. And, of course, you know, the liberals, the lefties, uh, Biden, they like to get out there and say that (laughs) that has never been clear. (laughs) You could never buy a cannon. Oh, well. Well, yeah, you could. Yeah, a lot of conservatives like to cite some letter that I think it was Madison, maybe. Somebody back around the Founding Fathers' time wrote to one of these, um, it was like a shipping company. I think they had a different term for it back then. But they, they told him, yeah, you can carry a cannon on your ship. Mm-hmm. So. Of course and, you can. Why right. not? An- it's free market capitalism. If right. you want to buy a cannon, buy a cannon. Now, there's probably rules you probably can't shoot your neighbor's house because they have private property rights, yeah. and you can't just sh- shoot people and shoot horses and right. shoot stuff, but you can buy a cannon. Why the 
Right. Why couldn't you buy a can? I'm sure even back in you know, the 1770s and 80s, they probably wouldn't allow you to just go strolling down the street with your can and terrorizing the neighborhood. Yeah. But you can carry one on your ship, I assume, if you could put one in your yard to fend off the British if they ever came back. Yeah, or even what if it's just a decoration piece? You want them at right. the either end of your driveway. Right. And they're not, like, loaded. You're not going to use them. They're just, right. like, decoration. Or they're leftover props or who knows right but at one of the main issues in this case that came from new york was um you know, new york uh has pretty uh, restrictive rules on who can um own a firearm within i believe new york city i don't know if this case was within new york city or just a state somewhere but it's um they had a few objective standards uh like you know passive background checks as training possibly stuff like that but they also had um what was uh let's see i'm trying to find the exact phrase oh probable cause i believe Yep, proper cause. Uh, it requires the applicant to de demonstrate proper cause uh, in needing a concealed carry license in the city of New York. Um, and two people uh, were denied um, their uh, ability to carry a firearm, even though one of the people had demonstrated you know, uh, a high rate of crime in their neighborhood. Uh, but the uh, government official who decides whether or not the, this person can have their concealed carry license said, nope, uh, they do not have proper cause to carry one, but you, they say he could use it for target shooting and hunting, which is not what he wanted. So, of course, uh, this fella, and well, I think it was two fellows along with um, some up, oh, yeah, the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association uh, sued the state, and um, th it was ruled in their favor that the Second Amendment does uh, um, guarantee the right to carry. And a couple other things that they wanted to emphasize in their arguments was. The, the term bear arms to and in, in that's written in the second amendment they argued that it was you know explicitly understood to mean that somebody can carry a firearm outside of their home uh you know by use of the term or word bear absolutely yeah you know. and uh they you know i believe they still said that the state can make you know, some restrictions like you know the background checks and other objective measurements. Well, and their I think their point on that is like you still can't take it into like a courtroom. Sure. And you still couldn't take it into like a school. Right. Like, you're allowed yeah. to put restrictions on individual places. Yes, yeah, sensitive areas. I think they might have been the term they tried to right. use. <clears throat> but other than that, you can't you know pass a law. Uh, basically, I think uh, Clarence Thomas phrases this way: giving, you know, uh, what did he say? A second-class citizen. Oh yeah, yeah. Something yeah. like that. You know, second-class rights. Yeah, second-class right. Like, because essentially, the only people who would have been able to have a concealed carry firearm are, you know, like celebrities or notable people who. May may be in particularly more danger uh, than the average person, but it was still preposterous to say the average person in New York City is not allowed to defend themselves. Right, and that's really what this all comes down to. Right. I mean, and uh, you know, there was as I've discussed before on this channel, there was a time in this country. Uh, you know, I love the old West mm -hmm. where everybody had a six shooter on their hip and. 
everybody knew it. You saw it. Right. Um, but just to get off that idea of the Old West, there was a time where we used to all treat each other like maybe everybody was carrying. Mm-hmm. Maybe everybody, it was sort of expected, you know, right. it, was, it was understood. We all had the right to pack heat and you never know. You don't just mouth off to somebody. You don't act like a fool in public because mm-hmm. you never know um, who's packing or, you know, right. who's going to defend themselves or who's going to step up and put you back in your place. Right. So uh, I don't think there's anything. I think it would be great for our society if just as a thought experiment, we all believed everybody to be carrying. Right. I bet you'd have a lot more civil of a society, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, you yep. think, well, don't step up to me and do something crazy because I'm carrying, you right. know? And I'll warn you. I'll put you back in your place. And same thing to others. You yeah. wouldn't just go mouthing off or, or doing something to put somebody in danger or something okay. like that if they were carrying— you know, right. they used to call it the great equalizer. And it is. I mean, some little oh, yeah. four foot nine, hundred and twenty pound girl. Right. Uh, probably doesn't really stand a chance against Hulk Hogan at yeah. the prime of his career. Exactly. Um, but I bet you if she had a Colt 45, yep. she'd have a much better chance exactly. at defending herself. Right. And that's, uh, you know, that's sort of. You know, a speculative question that kind of popped in my head. I wonder um, if these government officials who were either denying or granting these uh, permits, how um, how often they turned down women who felt they had a probable cause to defend themselves from you know somebody that they believed is stalking them or whatever maybe a you know a stereotypical abusive ex-boyfriend or something like that and you know this person who was in this case uh the new york pistol rifle pistol association case had demonstrated as i mentioned a moment ago that he they were he lived in a very high crime area and which most people would think that's probable cause to be able to defend yourself with a firearm. So it kind of like what you were saying, it's a great equalizer, and I'd be curious to know how many you know, uh, permits he turned down for, for uh, women who were looking for something. Well, plus, I think the phrase that you uh, said before was proper cause. Oh, yes. And not, the thing I would point out, cause. it's another thing like where they're like hypocrites and they like try mm-hmm. and change the meaning of words and, and the, the meaning of the constitution right. because what is better proper cause than the second amendment right. itself that says that we expressly have yeah. this right. Right. And then they try to say, well, you have to show proper cause. Well, what, th- what does that mean yeah, when I already have proper cause? Yeah. It's so arbitrary. <clears throat> and how does, I mean, from my understanding, there wasn't even, there's not a strict definition of what the proper cause may be. It's just up to these government officials in the state to decide. Well, and it's like, it's absolutely ridiculous because, I mean, what would be proper cause? Well, I was held up at gunpoint yesterday. Somebody yeah. stole my wallet, you know, and I'm afraid that might happen again. Well, the court, the, the government body might say, well, you already lost your wallet. They didn't take your life. Denied. Yeah. We, we don't see any... We don't see any threat to you or yeah, whatever. I mean, they could probably easily say, how do we know the next time they're not going to be able to steal your gun before you get to shoot them? And now we got a criminal running around with your gun on the streets. I mean, it's just preposterous. How do you show that right. you <laughs> yeah, need this right? Well, right. The, the burden should not have to be on the person requesting the permit. Well, especially when they're ex- they're taking away... All yeah. right. Yes, exactly. That's. I mean, it's preposterous. They should have to show why not to give somebody a gun. Right. The uh, See, now that's where the background checks and all that stuff. I do believe sure. that, that there needs to be some sort of infrastructure and regulation around, mm-hmm. around this stuff. But, you know, you'd have to demonstrate and say, well, this guy's wanted 
for this right or that or mm-hmm. oh look here two years ago he committed uh strong arm robbery right you know let's not give him a gun you right. know that makes a lot of sense sure but you take the average person who says oh i'm terrified to walk the streets because my neighborhood's gone to crap oh well it's not like you were held up at gunpoint we, mm-hmm. we don't think you need a gun right that's not for them to decide Right. Well, particularly in New York City, it's the same. It's the same city who has a, the DA who's barely prosecuting any of these, you know, violent crimes, letting these criminals back out on the street, and then they turn around and tell their citizens, uh, "Sorry, we might be letting these criminals back out, but we're not going to allow you to defend yourselves from them." Right. Your SOL. It's absolutely crazy. Yep. It is. But so that was another good win yes, to reaffirm yep. that we do have the right exactly. to self-defense. Exactly. We don't need the government to give us a permit. The permit is written right in the Constitution. That's right. And then I guess that kind of – does that lead us to our big one? Or are we gonna, Yeah, it okay. does. Yep, well, uh, yes, that leads us to the – Biggest, or what people would probably oh, no. say. Oh, we forgot the outlier. Oh, um, I guess we can bring that one up first, because I was Yeah, gonna... let's just slip it in. All right. Well. Because they're one, because like we, I was just saying, most of these seem like big wins. Right. Win, win, win. Right. And then there's this one that sort of is a head scratcher to me. I don't really get where they came from, why they decided it this way. Right. Um I think they're sort of giving Biden a win on this one, and I don't get um, why. I I don't really know. This is the case we're talking about is Biden v. Texas, and it deals with the Remain in Mexico or the uh, I think there's another more specific term, the Migrant Protection Policy or something like that, the MPP, something like that. But um, uh, after. Joe Biden had come into office. He uh, had the DHS rescind the policy. And then I believe it was Texas, along with the state of Missouri, together sued uh, the Biden administration over the policy. And in this case, the court uh, sided with the Biden administration in a five to four decision. And from my understanding, it it uh, is kind of a confusing case, but from one little video clip I saw, I'll include it in the show notes, it seems like um, there are kind of two things that uh, the court did. As they essentially said that uh, Congress has made immigration and foreign policy laws kind of confusing, that they don't even know what to do, and also... Uh, it's not the court's job to dictate foreign policy, so they, I think they sent it back to the lower court. And they also, from what I understand, basically said that this was an executive office uh, policy that was implemented, so the executive office can take it back. I don't understand that, though, because didn't you just say it was part of the MPP, some sort of act that it had been... I mean, does, doesn't that suggest that it came out of the Congress? See, that's part of what the confusion is. I'm, it's, I don't think it's very clear. Because my understanding from what I heard, the Remain in Mexico part did not come from Congress. But hmm. I guess we'll have to look at that one. But I think for you and I, our main point on this one is, at least I was going to mention that, you know, a lot of... Leftists and liberals complain about how Trump packed the court with conservatives and these justices are in the pockets of the Republican Party and only doing their bidding. If that were true, they would have upheld this uh, Remain in Mexico policy, which is heavily favored by Republicans and oh, conservatives. Oh, absolutely. When it makes I think it's very humane. Yeah. And it just makes logical sense, in, in my opinion, too. Right. So I don't get where the court's coming from. I mean, because it, 
I'm sure we've talked about it before on this channel, probably mm -hmm. a lot longer ago now. Um, hasn't come up very recently, but if you're really fleeing Guatemala, you know, because of how terrible things are there and you're in fear for your life or, or even if it's just economic, you can't get a job, you're just looking to try and do better for yourself or your family, you normally get to a, a good place a safe place, and you should be okay. I mean, the idea that you just get to pick and choose what country you want to belong to right? Um, as an economic or, or a hardship uh, immigrant is kind of preposterous. I mean, there's that phrase, beggars can't be choosers. So, <laughs> I mean, if you're fleeing because you're unsafe, that's really the key one. If, if you're fleeing because you're unsafe, in wherever you're from, you should be fine once you get to a safe place. Wh why does that have to be the Western world necessarily? I mean, if you can make it to Mexico and you're safe, uh -huh. I mean, you can still apply if you want to be an American citizen that bad and you want to be on a 10-year waiting list and pay damn near a million dollars to the United States government. Uh, you can do that. Right. <clears throat> But why do you have to be here to do it? Yeah, I don't really get it either. Um, maybe that's one we might have to kind of follow up on and see if we can't dig into a little deeper. Yeah. I mean, as far and as far as the you know the policy itself, uh, I don't really have too much. Uh, you know whether or not I think it's well. I think the the policy itself was was good. Uh, to help control the flow of the immigration and how many people were coming in. Uh, but the case itself... Uh, uh, we're not too clear on. Right, we're not too clear on, and it uh, wasn't particularly the, um, my focus. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's a good example of how, how the court works. The court doesn't always just side with one party or the other and this is an example of you know whether we agree with the court or not it's it is an example of the court doing its job they they looked at the law as they saw it and they applied the law again as they saw it and made their decision based on it yeah well and it does make sense to me i mean if it was an executive thing right um it makes sense that the next executive of the country would have the power to mm -hmm. change that policy. So. Yeah, so that does make sense if that was uh, the situation. Yeah, because once again, it just shows that things there is a proper way to do things right. in this country, and that's to have it go through the Congress right. and codified, as they love to say. Right, <clears throat> yep. And with that, I guess we're ready to move into the big one. Yep, the big one that you've probably already heard about and yep. everybody's been talking about. The Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health uh, something organization. I forget the full title of their group. Yeah. Or We're essentially colloquially Roe. known as yeah the overturning of Roe v. Wade. That's right. Which... Conservative people cannot be more happy about. That's definitely a big one. It's amazing. It's it is. one of the biggest victories that I've seen in my lifetime. Right. <clears throat> definitely. And uh, we all know, we even kind of talked about this in our last episode. The This essentially means that all you know, legislation regarding abortion has been turned back to each state to decide um you know it's not it's not federally recognized as any kind of right uh, the court has decided which i believe we sort of might have hinted at while we were talking about the case from new york with the second amendment it is a right Yes. And the court has upheld our Second Amendment right to be able to defend ourselves. And they also equally upheld that there is no constitutional right to an abortion. And a lot of liberals like to say how this is a contradiction. 
but it's not. Not at all. No. Now, the only thing that allowed for this quote-unquote right, or what I've always tried to phrase as the protections offered by Roe, the, mm-hmm. the Roe protection, uh, was just a, a ballooning of the 14th Amendment mm-hmm. and what they call the right to privacy. Right. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but this is absolutely preposterous, just on a philosophical level. Right. Um, the idea here, the, the way I have it here is it's been pointed out that libs want the Constitution to be a living document. Mm-hmm. They think that's important right. so that it can change and grow with the times. But on the same way, they, they don't believe the same thing for babies in the womb, right. that they could live. <laughs> <laughs> and grow uh, long time. So it's a, it's an important point, you know. Yeah. It's always been said that our rights and freedoms in this country cannot or should not infringe on the rights of others. Right. So I don't know. I'm willing to play a little thought exercise and say maybe we do have a right to privacy and maybe sure. you know equal application of the law. That's the Fourteenth Amendment. Yeah. We all have the same rights and protections and everything. Right. But <clears throat> under this idea, abortion fails. Right. Because your ability and choice not to have children ends once you have a child in the womb. Right. So this new person or new citizen mm-hmm. will have, eventually in time, the same rights as the mother, the father, or every other citizen. Right. And of course, no one has the right to kill another citizen or yeah. take away their rights. Exactly. So the idea that you have a right to privacy... To would ex- it would extend to the child as well. They yeah. have some right to privacy, and they're not going to have any privacy when you abort them. Right? They're not going to have any Fourteenth Amendment protections right. when they're aborted. Yeah. Um, so I mean, the the concept is farcical, right. and it's wonderful that the court saw this. And of course, it's not hypocritical at all. Right. It's, it's hypocritical that the liberals. <laughs> Would say such a thing, right? Well, I mean, I don't, don't believe this is this phrase is in the Constitution. It's in the Declaration of Independence, I believe. Uh, you know the uh, the right the right to pursue the uh, what is it the uh, pursuit of happiness, the uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. There we go. Could could get it. But um, like like I said, it's not in the Constitution, but I believe it was Abraham Lincoln that said, I might get them backwards, but something like uh, the Constitution is the golden apple uh, and the something like that, and the, and the Declaration of Independence is a silver frame around it, something like that. Does that sound familiar to you? Mm, I mean, it rings a little bit of a bell. Yeah, well, they basically go hand in hand. Um, and my point would be that, you know, how... How can we uphold the idea that people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness if we're going to try to say that another person has the right to prevent somebody from their right of life, life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Exactly. Because it starts at life because you don't get the other two without life. Mm-hmm. So it is from the Declaration of Independence, the exact language is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, Mm -hmm. that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yep. Second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. I'm just thinking if I could find a link to what I was trying to say. I'm pretty sure it was Abraham Lincoln who said something like, you know, a golden apple and a silver frame, one the well, declaration I think it, one. It, it makes one. a lot of sense that it would be him because um, there was a little bit of a constitutional crisis at his time. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, he was trying to f- provide a framework uh, in which the rights of, I mean, I don't like using this kind of language, but the rights of uh, landholding white men Mm-hmm. could be uh, extended to all men. Right. <clears throat> you know, which is 
it's sort of silly that we even had to do all that fight because once again to talk about the plain language of mm -hmm. our founding document it's right there that all yeah. men are created equal it doesn't say all white men all black men right. all puerto rican it doesn't say anything to that effect right it says all men and you know a learned person would know that they mean all of mankind right they don't mean just men Women. i mean yeah because <laughs> at the time man could include both man and women Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and especially in that language, yeah. they, they mean mankind. It's, yeah. it's very clear. Right. <clears throat> so this, uh, yeah, the Dobbs case is very important where that's, I don't know of a bigger case within our lifetime than this. No. And, you know, it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. More babies. Is always good to help further our population and for us to pass on our, you know, conservative values to. Because as I said before, these and past episodes, leftists and liberals don't even barely like children. If they don't even want to have them, they want to kill them. And if they don't get to kill them, they want to warp their minds into their own ideology. Or turn them into sexual objects right. as we've seen and discussed right uh, so it's it uh, as i've said before i think uh, you know conservative values have a better chance of outliving the leftism because of that well and there will be some big implications from yeah. this i mean some of them we've already seen like um one of the things One of the things that I think we called out in the last episode is I've already heard Biden when he came out and did a reaction to the Supreme, you know, the decision on Roe. Mm -hmm. um, he said that there will be real and immediate consequences for this decision, which to me reads as a justification of these riots that mm -hmm. have been going around. There's I mean. I've not heard so much about rioting per se, but there's been a lot of demonstrations, a mm -hmm. lot of people out in the streets, I mean, for days on end. Um, and then some of the language, y you know, that you heard from Pelosi or other language from Biden, um, they, they talk about how Pelosi said that the harm from this decision will be endless. The harm is endless. When once again, it's actually the opposite. Uh -huh. It's the opposite. It's completely the opposite. Right. The harm from the original Roe decision was endless. Yeah. I mean, except hopefully now we'll get closer to putting an end to it. Right. But the harm of abortion mm -hmm. is endless, <laughs> not the opposite. Right. You know, um, she called this deadly serious. Um uh, she said that the court has now effectively criminalized, and then she hesitated. She didn't want to say abortion. Mm. She chose reproductive choice. All their well, euphemism. Well, as we've discussed before, what is reproductive choice? Reproductive choice would happen before uh -huh. the reproduction. <clears throat> you don't... Yeah reproduce and then say oh i need to exercise my choice now yeah choice no came beforehand that's right there's so many preventative measures that you can take yep and of course i hate that we even have to say this but rape and incest are different cases mm -hmm. they are different sure okay i think that line is much easier to blur there right. but the idea that every pregnancy is the result of incest or rape is mm -hmm. farcical, and it does not play out in the data. Right. I think it's like less than 1% of all abortions in any given year. Um, right. And, of course, you have Biden dwelling on those negative mm -hmm. and scary aspects of it, talking about how women have to bear their rapist's child now, and women have to to have their incest babies. Mm -hmm. And it's just sickening the way they browbeat right. fair-minded people right. on this issue. Well, if, you know, I, w I would like to hear from 
uh, a woman who might be in that small group because you know imagine somebody actually is having to carry uh, a baby that's due to rape or something like that and here are all these you know liberals using their you know very extreme example, example to push a larger narrative that I'm. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of, uh, you know, you know, victims don't agree with this. You're gonna use our tragic example to push a bigger policy that barely even affects this example that they're using. Yeah, it doesn't bear out in the data. Right. Not at all. Right. And sort of to go, um, you're talking about like the idea that. Uh, uh, shoot what was sorry well i kind of forgot what you're saying but i was going to say while you're saying whatever it was that you know and the idea that these women are being absolved of all of their responsibility of you know their choices on who and when and how to have sex with somebody knowing from i'm pretty sure most you know 13 year olds and up know what happens you know how babies are made yeah surely they know what their period right. means mm-hmm. right and to absolve women of any responsibility of having to make better choices is kind of silly in itself too absolutely like they don't leftists don't believe in personal responsibility or accountability they want you to be able to do when well, they don't believe in an immaculate conception. Right. I'll tell you that. Well, yeah, they don't. They don't believe that uh, you should be. Well, they should. They believe you should be able to pretty much do whatever makes you feel good, and have no no consequences of it because it's all about their authentic self and expressing who they believe and they are, who they feel they are, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But it's just. I mean, I I have a feeling that it, it's setting up a larger issue, mm-hmm. like um, the inflammatory language that they're using. Mm-hmm. Um, like Pelosi even said that th- this case was decided by right-wing justices that Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell packed the court with. Oh, yeah. So you see, I mean, that's almost like, going to justify uh-huh. some yeah, of these calls we've already started to hear to to pack the court right they've also pelosi's made um and others not just pelosi but uh a lot of them like to point out that the conservatives on the court weren't being honest in their confirmation hearings oh yeah i've heard that too they lied under oath yeah almost as a way to suggest that we should uh or impeach them, them yeah. or something like that so you you have the you you almost see the stage being set mm-hmm. for either impeachment of the Supreme Court justices or let's pack thirteen more liberal justices on there right. or or whatever. Um, right. So, I mean, this issue is not dead. I mean, uh, right on the top, you know, right on the face of it, it goes to a state issue, state by yeah. state. So yeah. we're going to see more. More fighting within the states in right. the in the state courthouses and everything, mm-hmm. but I think on the national level too, this sets up for a larger fight, right? Of some kind. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to play out, but yeah, I'm sure there'll still be more legal challenges to the different laws that these states are passing. Um, you know, to try to get it re ro- reinstated somehow. Um, now I've heard a couple uh, liberals talk about how they they want to try to get it put through Congress, but they don't really have the ability to do so. They one they don't have the votes and for what the row protections? Yeah. Well, they've already tried. They tried earlier this year mm-hmm. and it failed. Right. And uh, they they better hope uh, they pick up more seats this fall if they're going to actually try to pack the court because well and that's nancy's trying to use it as yeah. that she says we cannot she says that the conservatives in this country mm-hmm. in the house 
want to make a full federal ban, so essentially in all the states, ban it in the states mm-hmm. even, uh, abortion, that right. there can be no abortion. And she says we cannot allow the conservatives to take a majority. So she's running on this. Yeah. Well, I'm just as, like, I don't think they the Congress has the power to – uh, do federal protections for Roe, I don't think uh, conservatives would have the power to do the opposite. Uh, unless, the only thing I can think of is if they permanently you know, uh, put in place the Hyde Amendment, because f- from my understanding now, they have to like vote on that every time they do like an appropriations bill or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can see maybe they try to get that officially codified going forward that you know absolutely no federal funds are used for any kind of abortion and it's not something they have to renew each time uh other than that from my understanding congress wouldn't have the power to do to either uphold roe or put in protections for roe or the opposite um do some kind of federal protection for abortion i mean I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not an extremist. I don't want to see them do it, but I think right. they would have the power because the protection of life of the citizenry mm-hmm. should be the government's highest priority. Right. And most of the state's constitutions uh, reflect the national constitution, uh-huh. which says that life and health and well-being of the citizens is the primary function of the state to protect that. Right. Um, so I think under that guise, it would make total sense that, uh, maybe the federal government were to say that California doesn't have the right to kill unborn citizens. Right. I, I could see an argument there. Yeah, I can too. Um, I, I've also heard that, uh, I mean, one way they can do something is to, the long and hard process of a constitutional amendment. If they really believe so stronger, strongly in this, they uh, can certainly try to convince you know all the states and all the people to go for it. Well, it's only like two thirds. Well, yeah, that's not a, not literally all, but yeah, the two thirds of them. But I don't think uh, that's going to happen. Oh, I don't think that would ever happen. No. Not in a million years. No, but, you know, it, Rome might be done federally, but the fight is still not over. If you're a conservative that lives in a blue state, you better start showing up to your houses of Congress. Oh, just to mention, f- one of the other oh. things I have in my notes is um, that not only— I think, you know, there will probably be calls to pack the court mm-hmm. and potentially— um, what did I say, impeach these justices or mm-hmm. whatever, remove them from office. But I think there's also been a lot of talk of removing the lifetime tenure of the Supreme Court justices mm-hmm. so that they have shorter terms and more turnover. Um, That'd be interesting. Yeah, I've heard that a little bit. And then also just to mention, because um, I know we're sort of wrapping up here, but we did recently see a change yeah. in the complexion of the court. Almost went unnoticed. Yeah. little quiet last minute yep. thing, but Justice Breyer swore in his replacement, that yep. Katanji Jackson. Yep. So in the next term, we'll be hearing from a new justice. That's right. And for all the historicness of it, the day of her being swearing in kind of went with very little fanfare from what I could tell. I mean, I saw... You know, just a couple articles saying that, you know, he was out and she was in, but compared to when they first announced it was going to be her and how historic it was going to be, if if you weren't watching the news, you wouldn't even know. Well, and as we've said, it's not like there will be much of an impact on the court at all. Yeah. Yep. Uh... It's basically replacing one liberal with uh, even more liberal. Yeah. So, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, she might, 
I doubt she will surprise us, but uh, you never know. She uh, might throw some curveballs. That'd be, that'd be something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would. Uh, but well, anyway, I'm sure we'll certainly be covering the cases that come up in the next term of yep. the court. And uh, right. we'll always be here with our analysis and our opinions. Uh, so we yep. hope that you'll continue to tune in as yeah, we track some worth. of these cases. <coughs> yep, and um, I b- believe with that, it's that's pretty much all the notes I have on this all SCOTUS episode. They were pretty busy these past couple of weeks of them wrapping up their term. And uh, definitely some... Big implications coming out of the the closing of the term, and some really good decisions. Right, some really good ones. Yep, definitely. Oh, and just to point out, uh, we did call that row would be overturned. Uh, we've said that many times, mm-hmm. but I wanted to point out that I was wrong on how it was decided. I thought it would be five four. It was six three. Yeah, Roberts um, surprised some people. Yeah, he surprised me. Yeah. I mean, his uh, opinion probably wasn't exactly what we would want. But it wasn't as strong right. as it should have been. Right, but it's, it's still on the right side. Yep. So that's, that's all we can ask for at this point. That's right. And with that, listeners, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to wherever you get your podcasts. Spotify, Apple, and many other popular platforms. You can also find us on YouTube. And be sure to email us your own opinions, thoughts, and comments. You can find our email addresses in the show notes. And I believe... Oh, and be sure to visit our website, contemporaryconservative.net, for additional details and content. And as always... Thanks for listening.